went uh, simply because I uh, decided to. I, I don't have any particular literary talent. I just like hearing all of your terrible stories. Um, so we're gonna get started. I will start things off. How many people were here uh, besides Sunny and Mike? How many people were here last year? And Doug and okay, so a few. All right. Well, this is gonna sound familiar then because I didn't write anything new. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, Gork versus Adolf Spacler. <laughs> Book two of the Gorgilogy. The dust settled as the USS Super Freedom set down on Space Argentina. Its ramp extending as its outer door opened. Psh, it said. Gorg stepped out of the airlock. They said this air would be breathable, sang a familiar voice over the external speaker. He wasn't sure why he liked listening to that song when stepping onto a dangerous new planet. The M dwarf star above bathed this one in an ultraviolet light, making it look like a landscape from a velvet Elvis painting. <laughs> Except this painting wanted to rip out his spleen and boil his dude juices. Which wasn't how paintings normally worked. Wait for me, Gorg, called his companion, rolling down the ramp after him on several of his appendages. It was Shazbot, a beach ball sized sentient robot covered in dozens of sex appendages of every size and species. Gorg had rescued it from the sex mines of Volbo Prime in an adventure from the first book. I told you not to call me that, Gorg said gorgly. Shazbot, the half-Jewish sex robot, paused. Oh right, they're half-Jewish, that's important later. <laughs> Fine, said Shazbot, several space dildos sagging in resignation. Wait for me, it mocked. Gorgonzola. The character formerly known as Gorg sighed. Why do you make everything so hard? No such thing is too hard in my line of work, quips Swatch Shazbot. Stop trying to flirt with me. You wish, meat man. You're not my type. You know I sexually identify as a non-Newtonian flu non fluid. Gross, Gork gorjected. Prude, said Shazbot. The daily pleasantries concluded, the pair headed off to the west. Out there, somewhere beyond the nerf caves and the upside-down lava falls, was their greatest enemy but also the greatest prize, the legendary jewel-encrusted crown of Xanax the Calm, worth six billion space bucks. That would let Gork finally pay off his debt to Galactic Emperor Reagan. He could give up space adventuring for good and follow his dream to be a space librarian. Yes. Thank you. Continuing the terribleness, please welcome Mike. Hello, everyone. How's everyone going? Uh, that was just my excuse to get this stall. Uh, so I was on holiday last year um, in Spain with my, my wonderful wife over there, Sunny. Um, and there was this massive storm off in the distance. And I stood on the balcony and thought to myself, man, that storm is fucking sexy. So as the storm gradually approached our apartment, I sat near the window while she made us dinner. And, uh, and I wrote what I can only describe as a weather-based eroticum. Um, if it ends a little abruptly, it's only because dinner was ready. And I apologize for slapping you with audience participation right off the bat, but it is mandatory. Johnny Hard Drive woke up in a cold sweat, just as his clock ticked over to 2 a.m. Johnny was a small boy of just seven years old once, but now he was an enormous grown man with even more enormous arms that made everybody say, wow, those are enormous arms. Every time he walked into a room, it sounded like this. Wow. Johnny looked out the window of his seaside farmyard bar bungalow in Bermuda and saw it. Off in the distance at first, just a little flicker of activity, blink and you'd miss it, a little flash of distant lightning, or, or maybe it was just a camera? But soon enough it came closer, bearing down on him with the determination of an angry buffalo. It started tussling even the larger branches of his favourite palm tree. He could see its might as it approached, picking up distant boats and smashing them into the ocean. Dogs barked, parrots squawked, and vultures crowed deeply with anticipation. At that moment, Johnny Hard Drive knew he was going to get fucked by that storm. <laughs> Johnny watched and waited as the lightning grew nearer, gruffly counting under his breath the seconds between the lightning and thunder to measure its distance and anticipate its arrival. He had done all he could to prepare, boarding up the windows, burying the tractor, tying down the pigs, and tickling the lucky spider. He could feel his breath quickening as the storm grew nearer. He looked up to see his windsock completely erect, held up by both the literal and spiritual weight of the storm that he knew would soon be on top of him. And all of a sudden, it came. 
<laughs> as soon as the first gust hit him, he knew it would be worse than he'd prepared for. This one was going to be harder and wetter than he'd ever seen. And then he saw it, off in the distance. One of the pigs had gotten loose and found itself on the edge of the cliff, grip, gripping on by its little pig claws to the slippery rock as waves lapped at its hungry feet. I don't know what that means. Johnny felt something swelling up inside him. A moment of introspection told him it wasn't his usual horniness. After all, he was already rock solid before spotting the pig. This time, the emotion was compassion. Johnny had never felt like such a multi-dimensional character, and he was thrilled at the opportunity to share both of his wonderful dimensions with the world. Johnny practically dived out his front door before he'd even made it off the porch. He was blinded as a bolt of lightning shattered his favorite tree. So we're going to play it that way, are we? He said, though the storm showed no signs of listening. He ran across the beach as the wave lapped at his feet and lightning shattered one palm tree after another like the ending of the movie 1917 with all the explosions. As he neared, he gained a better view of the situation. At the end of a narrow, rocky outcrop being lashed by the wind and waves was his prized sow Esmeralda. And Johnny was almost there, just the treacherous walk along Dead Man's Trail, a narrow series of rocks with a sheer thousand foot fall on either side. And it required a jump so lengthy it seemed to go on forever, and so girthy too, the failure of which could plunge him to immediate death, dashed onto the rocks to be never heard from again. No problem, he'd done it a thousand times before. During the day, Johnny surveyed the trail, preparing for what was laid out before him, the storm spitting in his face. He thought he saw it turn its concentration to some other part of the cliff for the moment and took his chance. With all of the grace Johnny could remember from his high school floor gymnastics classes, he jumped. He soared across, and just as he thought something was finally going right for him, the storm showed him who was boss. A gale force wind with a fresh sheet of rain hit him, and what looked like a surefire success became yet another battle with destiny. All in a day's work for the strapping young bad boy Johnny Harddrive. He watched as his feet fell past the rock that he had been so close to landing on. He hit it with his chest, feeling a hard, disorienting thud through his body, followed by his inevitable pathetic scramble of trying to find purchase with his hands before he would slip down to his warm, wet mistress below. Not just below, all around him. He was inside the powerful wet storm and he loved it. The storm pushed him down until he was holding on by just his fingertips. It spat in his face to show him just to, just to show him it could. And just as Johnny thought he had no choice but to let go, it loosened its grasp on him. The rain was gone and the air was still as Johnny pulled himself up on the ledge and rolled over onto his back, looking up at the storm. This wasn't the end and he knew it. He looked it in the eye and begged for mercy. And then it hit him again. And then he got the pig and got all the way home and was fine, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Next up is Tara. Yeah, Tara. Woo! Woo! Dave, you're making me follow that guy. I can show my friends. Okay, this is my first time doing a uh, first, first page. Woo! Woo! Failing already. All right. Uh, this is untitled. Um, Step forward a little. Yes. Now can you hear me? Yes. yes. You don't want to miss this. <laughs> the first thing that I felt was a stuffy nose. It wasn't the oxygen tubing that insinuated itself like a disfavored lover into the warm, moist welcome of her nasal passages. <laughs> Rather, it was the erstwhile gauze, once carefully packed firmly, yet carefully into her face holes and completely soaked with only the best cognac. Unfortunately, in the ensuing years, since cut I was racked and stacked like a side of meat, awaiting the caress of the legendary pugilist of cinema fame, Rocky Balboa, which was totally unlike the living, feeling, and comprehensively sexual being that she was. The gauze slowly, but inevitably and completely, had disintegrated into a ball of mucus that reformed itself as if imbued by a true spark of us, uh, Asclepius, resulting in an ungentle and unyielding plug that would be eschewed by even the most adventurous enthusiast. <laughs> My husband, everyone. <laughs> After an ineffective snort, 
and a little gagging resulting from a sturdy and persevering scrap of cotton tickling the back of her throat. Not entirely unlike the feeling of a tampon ineffectively inserted into a vagina. Kai slowly sat up, pugilistically fighting against the inevitable and sour nausea induced by her long sleep. And also the cheap burrito that she had spontaneously and regrettably scarfed down just before they put her under. She slowly, gradually, methodically turned her head to regard the stasis pods arrayed exactly identically on the opposite side, opposite side of the chamber, with one key and important difference. Alessandra was in one of them. Exactly which one she couldn't recall, but no matter. The entire row was imbued with her inevitable majestic presence. Soon, my love, Ka'ai whispered, emphatically, but generally directed all the pods, just in case. It was needful that she forestall her long and a bit longer. After all, she had waited eons to once more hold Alessandra in her embrace. She could suck it up a few more parsecs. <laughs> Everybody. I don't know why these always tend toward erotica, but they do. Uh, sorry. That's all right. That's sorry. You got to lean in. All right. Uh, next up, uh, speaking of uh, Tara Sundin. Oh, no? Okay. Well, then, never mind. Uh, next up is uh, Sunny. Hi. I hope you're ready to hear more about me and my husband's favorite fail son, Johnny Hard Drive. Yes. We birthed him last Joker. <laughs> Just remember you heard me before I got the poets in the future. Okay. Johnny Hard Drive was in a pickle so big that it was a real shame the Guinness Book of Records people weren't around to measure, verify, and immortalize it. I should have brought some of those guys with me, he thought, when I got dragged into this place. It would have been easy because Johnny was the greatest hacker in the world and so was always being followed by an entourage of record keepers, keen to note down his jaw-dropping feats of cyber athleticism. He should have grabbed one that day his computer screen melted and a viscous green hand reached out, picked him up by the scruff of his leather trench coat and pulled him into shite Mordor. <laughs> In the brief time he'd spent here, Shite Mordor had not been kind to Johnny Hard Drive. This was mainly because it had no internet, no electricity, and worst of all, was plagued by some kind of hippie bullshit called magic. Johnny was dimly aware of the concept of magic because it was physically impossible not to be when you were a computer guy. The problem was, ever since Johnny had first laid hands on the slick, gleaming curves of a laptop, he had instantly become too cool for the nerds, geeks, and dweebs who could have educated him on the finer points of fantasy. This man had never escaped a rune or bouldered a gate in his life. <laughs> because the charisma that emanated from his paws with every TikTok he pushed to the GitHub Mastodon cloud base kept him simply too busy from the near constant sex having to learn about fire, lizards, and glowing balls of power. Besides, he's already glowed, so what was the point? <laughs> In short, Johnny Hardrive was the most genre-blind man to ever be transported to an alternate dimension that would have been every other keyboard Casanova's wet dream. His fuck-ups were just like his conquests, huge, immediate, and impressively girthy. <laughs> Which is how he found himself being slowly edged off a cliff by a big man with an even bigger sword, and not in the fun way either. Come on, Johnny said, spreading his hands out reasonably, like the love child of Spock and Mr. Rogers. There must be some other way to settle this. The big man laughed, like a 90s internet connection, and pressed the sword harder into Johnny's neck. Johnny winced as he shuffled backward. Because of the laugh, not the sword, which was kind of turning him on, being horny was Johnny's primary emotional regulation strategy, and the only reason he wasn't having a death con one panic attack right now. You make me laugh, said the big man, redundantly. Ah, said Johnny, batting his velour eyelashes. Are you flirting with me? 
The man's face changed, like an interlaced PNG file loading on dial-up. <laughs> Don't be stupid, he growled, as his pupils dilated ambiguously. I'm going to kill you. The sword bit into Johnny's throat, like when you're building a computer and cut your palm open on one of the metal plate thingies. He shuffled back a few inches. Unfortunately, so did the sword. Very clever. Killing me won't bring back your enchanted ambulance, said Johnny. I'm sorry I ate it, but it just looked so much like a Tide Pod and amulet, the man shouted so loudly that Johnny almost jumped off the cliff himself. It was an enchanted amulet, you wretched fool, and by eating it, you robbed me of its power forever. Killing you may not bring it back, he continued, with a smile like a poop knife, but it'll make me feel better. I wrote this a full year ago, I don't remember most of it. I can make you feel better, tried Johnny with a coquettish head tilt. He tried to angle his hips seductively at the same time, but overbalanced, and one of his feet skidded off the cliff edge. He scrambled like a cartoon egg and regained his footing, doing his best to style it out, which was difficult when the sword hovering near your face was literal and not metaphorical. Nonetheless, he settled for leaning his cheek against the big man turned red immediately, like an LED. His face was now the exact color of Johnny's code when it wasn't working right, a shade he encountered extremely rarely and therefore found extremely distressing. Johnny lurched backward, his feet now half off the cliff. A few rocks came loose and plunged him into a few rocks came loose and plunged into the abyss behind him, doing that falling object whistling noise that Johnny always thought was non-diegetic until now. Does this place have magic rocks? he wondered. Stop making that damn sound, growled the big man. And Johnny blinked in surprise as he realized the noise was indeed coming from him. It had been years since he had done it. It was his former primary method of emotional regulation before he switched to horniness. Now it only happened in times of truly great stress. I don't think I can stop it, Johnny said. Maybe if you put down the sword and let, and let me let you make me make other noises, he added with a charmingly crooked smile, like Doug Judy with scoliosis. The man became even redder, and the whistling noise got louder. Johnny wondered whether dying in shite mortal meant you died in real life. His folk pulled the sword back, ready to let Johnny out. Johnny whistled harder than he ever had before, and the big man exploded like a viral internet challenge, shooting out blo gloops of blue, orange, and white liquid that reminded Johnny of all the laundry he hadn't yet done. The only trace of him that remained was the sword, which clattered to Johnny's feet like the belt of a soon-to-be sexual conquest. <laughs> the whistling noise quietened, turning into that cool, low whistle that people do when something impressive happens before falling silent. Johnny felt something shifting in his guts, not in a sexy way, and then he remembered the big man's demented ravings as he chased Johnny out of his home and onto the cliff. That amulet is mine! Its power was mine, to do anything I dreamed of, but now you've gone and eaten it, and the thing I need to explain to you so this story makes sense is that the amulet binds to the first person who touches it, so even if you shout it out, it's useless to me. Stuck to an idiot is too stupid to even use it, or you would have by now to stop me chasing you off this cliff. Johnny smiled and picked up the sword, licking it. He didn't need to, but now it was a habit. He formed habits very easily. Too stupid to use it, huh? He said to himself, to distract from the fact that he just accidentally cut his tongue on the sword. He paused, cinematically. So the people who filmed his life and streamed it as HBO's most profitable show would have time to add a dramatic cut and look directly into one of the many cameras that had successfully followed him into Shite Mordor. I think you mean too stupid to use it deliberately. <laughs> You ready? All right. Give it up for Doug. All right. Right here, Doug. Here he comes. All right. Well, I can't deal with Johnny Howard, right? But this is my, my humble approach. This one's called Wild Goose Chase. It was a cool fall day, and Clancy's was buzzing. K Street folks with their martinis, shoulder to shoulder with a natty bow mustachioed set. Hot Wing Wednesdays really packed them in. I slid onto the last open stool, straight before a spot. I raised a finger. Great goose. The bartender winced. Her eyes, 
darted to the side as she poured my drink. Bermuda. My bar neighbor hissed from deep within the folds of a trench coat, face shadowed by a wide-brimmed hat. Excuse me? That swill is distilled in Bermuda. What the fuck do they know about anything? Try iceberg. I'm sorry? You want iceberg? National Vodka of Canada. He waved a baggy sleeve to get the bartender's attention. Two icebergs. Put it on my bill. Hey, pass those cashews. I sipped at my drink. My neighbor tapped me on the shoulder, and I jumped. Cashews! Uh, so, sorry, I, I didn't. I ain't got all day. Some of us got places to be. I fumbled under the pile of napkins until I found the bowl and passed it to him. He dumped a pile into his sleeve and tossed the nuts deep into the shadows under his hat. I kept my head down and nursed my vodka. After a minute, he coughed. It was an awful sound halfway between a cat with a hairball and someone stepping on an asthmatic accordion. <laughs> my neighbor put both sleeves to what I assumed was his neck. He choked and hacked and coughed. I slapped him on the back a few times until a nut shot out of his mouth and hit the bartender on the back of his head. Red. A single brown feather wafted down, fluttering across the bar until it landed in my drink. Fucking peanuts, he hissed at me. You trying to kill me? I'm, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know, he mocked. Goddamn civilian, you wouldn't last one day in the V. His other neighbor put a sleeve on his shoulder. Easy, Gus, he's not worth it. I stood up. Hey, hey, I didn't mean... Gus stood up. He was shorter than I thought, but there was something in his eye that made me feel like a razor-sharp carving knife was dancing at my spine. The bartender drew her finger across her throat and shook her head. I backed away until my ass hit the door. That's right, chicken, was the last thing I heard as I turned and ran. I knew better than to look back. Thank you.